The recording has started, right? Mic is on. Ah, the recording has started? Yes. Okay, we can start now. This is this is the usual question. Ready for more people? Uh, yeah, it's very nice. Okay. Good welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Dipanjan Mukherjee. I'm a faculty here. Yeah. And I'll be talking about radiative processes. So, this is uh, one of the most fundamental points. Point is this. So this is one of the most fundamental processes that is very important for astrophysics. Why? Because astronomy is all about understanding what's happening out there in the cosmos. And the main thing that you, we use now is electromagnetic radiation. Nowadays, we have added one more thing, this gravitational astronomy. We can get gravitational wave signals coming. But so far, the major bulk of astronomy has been uh, dealing with electromagnetic radiation. So, how do we understand how to characterize? Suppose some object, some star is emitting some light at some point. That signal is coming towards us. How do we quantify it mathematically to express this in some sort of some sort of equation to find out the flux emitted by the star that is coming towards us? That is the fundamental process of radiative transfer. So in this series of four lectures, we'll touch upon the very basics. Radiative transfer, I'll, I'll deal with in a bit more detail to understand. So given uh, intensity distribution at a given location, how do we propagate that intensity to the location of the observer by adding some sort of So that is one thing. Second point is then we will try to understand what are the basic emission mechanisms that give rise to the emission that we see. And some of the fundamental emission mechanisms that the four that we discuss, those four occur in different kinds of astrophysical uh, processes. Okay. And the combination of this gives rise to all sorts of radiation techniques. So, just a fair warning this set of lectures, at least for this are beyond today, today would be quite detailed. The next set of lectures would be a bit shallow because this whole Thing usually takes about 12 to 14 lectures in a graduate school course. But what I would want you to take away from this set of, and also these are quite advanced as you go for the second and third, like third and fourth lecture on this, you'll go quite advanced. What I want you to take away from this is some of the basic conceptual understanding of what is happening. So, in case you ever come across these later on in your life, in your, in your studies, you would then know where to go back to and when to start. Okay, so in terms of textbooks, the primary textbook we use for this subject is David's Process and Astrophysics by David and White. So, this is there in the library when you would want to have a look at it. The chapter one, which is called Radiative Transfer, is what I will be focusing on today. Today's lecture. There's another very nice book by Malcolm Longhair uh, called Finality Astrophysics. It comes in different versions, one with this, um, uh, one edition with part one and part two, and one with just uh, everything combined together. Now, Longhair's book is very helpful if you want to study the different types, mechanisms of radiative uh, emission process. This book, Foundations of Radiation Hydrodynamics by Vihalas and others, is one of the fundamental textbooks to understand the coupling of radiation with standard the gas things. In many of the cases we do uh, in, in astrophysics, you often happen that radiation become, pressure due to radiation becomes compared to due to uh, gas pressure. So then when we have to treat the movement of fluids and you have some set of lectures on fluid dynamics as well, the two become coupled. So some of the foundational work was done by I will not directly use some of these, but the basics of the radiative transfer equation when generalized to a time dependent system. That formulation I will take from here. If you ever interested, you are welcome to read this book for more details. And of course, uh, there is Jackson for the basics of 
and emission mechanisms, liquid magnetic fields, etc. So uh, before that, uh, let's just show of hands how many are masters and how many are bachelor students here, like BTEC or BSc and masters. So masters, how many are there? Okay, and bachelors and BTEC, the rest. Okay, so this looks like a 50 50 degree. The reason I was asking was some of the concepts of um, retarded potentials, etc., are usually not there in a bachelor's, but uh, I will try to uh, gloss over them. You will encounter them if you are from the bachelor's domain, you will encounter them later when you from your master's. Okay, good. So the first thing that I wanted to discuss was the fact that when we see radiation on the ground from Earth, we only can see a small band of radiation wavelengths. The rest of it is absorbed by the posture. So this is very important to understand because then we get an appreciation of what to observe phenomena in a, in a certain frequency range, what kind of telescopes we need. For example, let's start with the basic first. The visible band, this is open, so it's transparent. So this is the standard light we see. Let's go to higher frequencies. So this is wavelength. Increasing wavelength is high frequency. So first is UV, then X rays and gamma rays. If we go to the highest frequency, X rays and gamma rays, you can see the opacity. So this uh, brown bar refers to the transmission coefficient or the transparency of the atmosphere to that particular frequency. It's almost opaque up to UV. What happens in X-rays and gamma rays is these are extremely highly energetic photons. They'll come and strike in the neutral atom or even partially ionized atoms and molecules and kick out an electron. In this process, get absorbed. So these photons will ionize the atmosphere and quickly get absorbed. So if there's a thick column of uh, gas, neutral or partially ionized, so that will absorb the high energy system. UV, we've all known about gold warming, that gets trapped by ozone. There's a set of chemical reactions that happens when it's out of uh, oxygen atom. So, after UV, we cannot observe this from, uh, from the ground surface. We can go to higher altitudes, where the thickness of the atmosphere decreases. As you know, it's not really a linear decrease, it decreases very rapidly. So in the stratosphere or even higher, where the densities are lower, by the lunar experiments, we can get these photons. However, best is if we go even higher orbits, space-based telescopes. So for these, for observing the universe at these frequencies, we need to go to space. These we can observe from ground-based telescopes. Uh, lots of ground based telescopes. The op so these are called optical wavelengths and optical telescopes. Beyond the optical telescope, you can see there are a lot of these spikes. So there are some certain frequencies where it is transparent, and certain frequencies where it certainly shoots down. So these are the infrared wavelengths. IR is very nicely absorbed by some of the molecules in the atmosphere. So what happens is the molecules have some vibrational states. They are coupled with dipoles and other higher order poles, multiples. And these vibrational states are excited by this infrared radiation. So that is why you have the spikes that happen. So observe these. To observe these, you can again go to higher altitudes. So, for example, mm -hmm. a nice telescope, infrared telescope that is operated by NASA is called SOFIA. You can look it up. It is mounted on the back portion of an airplane. So it goes to higher altitudes, opens the split, and as the plane flies, it observes the infrared sky. But of course, the most well known now is the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, and that is observing the universe at the IR ranges. Okay, so this is the IR bound. Or you can also go to higher altitudes. One of the uh, nice telescopes now that has come up is called ALMA, ALMA. It is a radio telescope, but it covers and closes in towards infrared ranges. 
And that is at an altitude of, I think, 5,000 meters in the Chilean desert. <laughs> so as you go to high altitudes, the absorption coefficient is less, and you can get such a color. Then the atmosphere becomes very transparent for radio frequencies. And that is why, again, there is a domain of frequencies or wavelengths over which you can view the phenomena in space or outside using telescopes on the ground. This is, for example, what is there in the GMRT, neighbors next door. And then suddenly, again, it shoots up because the thin layer of ionized gas in the phosphate atmosphere that reflects out the radio. Uh, any frequency lower than the plasma frequency of the atmosphere will get reflected out. Similarly, any radiation beam from Earth will get reflected back from the atmosphere. That is how you have radio transmissions. So it's important to appreciate that these two bands are where you can build telescopes on Earth. Now, there are still issues that I, I think should be covered by somebody talking about the instrumentation side of things. Even though these are transparent, it may not always be that we can observe them at all frequencies. For example, the radio telescopes, there's a lot of interference from the human uh, activities, like mobile phones, cell phone towers, etc. For the visible bands, you have to go to a dark side. Otherwise, lights from neighborhood cities really pollute and creep onto the, uh, the, the observing window of the desk. So that is the first concept that you could appreciate, that uh, not everything is observable on Earth. Second is, if you do get some transmission of some radiation, usually from any astrophysical object, the spectrum of the radiation The spectrum of the radiation. So, I hope you're all familiar with what is the definition of spectrum. It's a distribution of energy as a function of wavelength of frequency. The spectrum is usually characterized by a standard average form of the spectrum with some lines. So, this is also something that you should appreciate is the average nature of the spectrum. It's called the continuum part of the spectrum. So, no matter what kind of uh, emission is happening in the waves, emissions happen due to transition of electrons. You take an electron to a higher count, high level, comes down, emits a photon. So, the quantum mechanical nature of emission is the fundamental, as lies at the fundamental uh, reason of why you see emission. <laughs> what happens in the continuum emission is this distribution of wavelength of, of levels of transitions happen over a broad range of so that is why you see a broad range of wavelengths over which you will see the emissions. However, at certain points you can see there are some peaks in the emission lines. No matter if you're a bachelor's or master's, you must have done experiments of emission lines. So these Peaks of emission line occurs because there is some concentration of some element with some uh, with a certain level of population of going to level two and going to transitioning down to level one. So these are excited atoms, which gives rise to these emission lines. So in any system uh, or any astrophysical object that we observe, irrespective of what wavelength or what window we are observing it through. We always have a continuum distribution underlying the basic structure of the spectrum and emission lines and absorption lines. I come to absorption lines next. And absorption lines. But I want to talk. Suppose you have the, the state, the datum in the higher energy state ready, or the lower energy state, sorry. Then a photon comes, hits an atom. And the photon is absorbed. This is an absorption. 
is the absorption of magnesium two. So in a realistic spectrum, this is from an anti-galactic nuclei or a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. It gives rise to a spectrum like this. However, you can see the spectrum is completely deformed with lots of small, small absorptions. All of these absorptions are happening due to neutral microscope. What is happening is this light is coming from a quasar, as we call it, or you learn about it in our lectures and activity. That is very far away from us. And as the photons are traveling from the object towards us, it faces neutral gas along its trajectory at different distances from us. And in your lectures in cosmology, you'll see that as an object is far away, the wavelength changes with the redshift of the object. You will all learn what is the concept of redshift, etc. Et so the, it's essentially like a Doppler, cosmological Doppler shift. You know, I have to explain it. So all of these absorptions are because there's some parcel of neutral gas located at different distances along its path. So at the rest spring of the of the hydration gas, the absorption will be a 30 But that is Doppler shifted at different frequencies, and that is why you get this broad range of absorption. So this is very one nice absorption profile. It's called the Dunn Peterson effect, where you see uh, emission coming from a distant quasar getting absorbed like this. Which shows that there is neutral hydrogen along this path. If you do not see this, that means all of the intervening gas is completely ionized. There is no neutral component there. But besides this cosmological context, we also have local effects. For example, this particular absorption program, what is happening is there is a central black hole, uh, and the radiation is coming from that black hole towards us. While it is coming, a parcel of gas is falling into the black hole. So it is stuck coming as a screen between us and the black hole. And that is how you see this absorption profile. And if you and this absorption profile is represented not in wavelength, but kilometers per second. Why? Because the gas parcel is moving. So there is Doppler shift. If the gas is not moving, it will be static, then the absorption will happen exactly at the wavelength of the absorption of, of the transition. Then there is no Doppler shift, so the velocity will be zero. We just use the Doppler shift formula, you can transform the wavelength to the velocity. And then you can get a positive velocity, which is the, uh, from, and the thing is moving towards the ground. So these are some of the standard uh, descriptions of emission and absorption. The reason why I'm introducing it is this. I will discuss what are the basics of, or the, what are the definitions of emissivity and absorption coefficient. So when I talk about any specific intensity, the emissions and absorption, you should always remember this naturally connects to actually what is observed. So we are now observing these things, which is you can see on the y-axis it's called relative intensity. So then it becomes important to understand, understand what are the units of the things that we are measuring. And how are they how can we mathematically describe them through the Power of the emission, that is, of, of the energy per unit area per unit time being emitted by the distant object. So, to do that, we will do something called the radiative transform. This is So first, we will define something called specific intensity or timing. The definition is, is the amount of energy through a unit area, through an area T area, along the direction normal to that area, into a solid angle to omega, per unit time, per unit frequency. Okay? So let's look at this mathematical formula. This is delta E divided by area divided by time, divided by solid angle, 
So what are the units? The thirds per centimeter square per second per steady per hertz. This is the definition. Don't ask me why. This is the definition. You'll soon see that when we write the equations like this, it is very easy to relate this to the total energy of the system. Okay, but also what is important to consider is uh, definition of intensity is related to the area normal to the direction to a given, any given direction. So if you have an arbitrary area to which you want to find what is the intensity for that area. So don't worry. So if you have a general area like this. If this is normal to the area, then the intensity along this direction exactly follows this definition. However, if I want to find the intensity along this direction, because intensity is always defined with respect to a direction or towards a d omega solid angle towards that direction, then we cannot use this uh, form, form, form of this area. If this area is the A, we have to identify an area that is normal to this surface. So that would be dA cos theta. Get the area towards the direction of the interest. Why am I saying this? Because of the next definition, which is class. How do we define that? It's the amount of energy through a given area dA. Now I'm not talking about the direction anymore. Any arbitrary area surface dA per unit time integrated over all solid angles. Now intensity is along a given direction. So if you just look at this figure now, this is more illustrated. Intensity is, is if you define the function intensity or if you know a priori what is the directional distribution of the radiation that is coming through a given area, then intensity along each different theta is different. So intensity along this theta going towards this omega is I knew along this omega, I knew as a function of theta. Now I have to integrate over the entire distribution. Do note now that this intensity or the, I have said it's a total energy. So in the definition of intensity, which is EAN is there, which is the area normal to it. I can replace this by DA cos theta. So now if I want to find the total energy or take it to the to take everything towards this side. But then I want to divide it by per unit time per unit frequency. So the new D remains. I just have to take D omega and D A cos theta on this side. But then I also need D a per unit area. So just cos theta. Was this clear? So then the total flux when I integrate over all solid angles with I new cos theta D omega. So again, a given area will have a well-defined direction normal. Uh, vector. So the intensity is when we get over the theta solid angle of the plus. Now let us relate the intensity with energy density. Again, I'll keep on repeating this uh, this, this form. Intensity by definition is delta E I Q D omega D A plus theta. This is the total energy passing through a given surface. So if I just take a pencil the radiation traveling along that beam, what is the volume carved by the radiation beam? That is C times dt, that is the length of the radiation in time dt, and dA cos theta. Okay. So what is the energy density of the pencil beam? Now what I'm considering, so suppose the intensity is along this direction. What is the energy density in now within a volume? Uh, uh, covered by this radiation along this direction in time dt. So, if I have to draw a figure again, if I can illustrate this.
What I want to find out is in time dt, the radiation travels from here to here, the path length of c times c. What is the total energy within this volume? So that is what I'm trying to find out. So first of all, the volume of this element is what we like to C times dt, which is the length, and dA cos theta, which is the area normal to this. So this is the total energy, this is the volume. You divide it, you get the energy density. Energy density, delta E by delta V. And if you just divide this, you'll find all of that remains is I mu by C V omega. So this we will define a new quantity, this U omega D omega. It is the energy density per unit solid angle. So this is the total energy density. Now U omega is the energy density per unit solid angle. So intensity is related to the energy density per unit solid angle as Q omega is I mu by C. This is very important because we will directly use this in when we study black body radiation in the next lecture. So then total energy density summed over all, all angles. Yes, we just multiply it with the domain and integrate over the D. And as you can then now define a new quantity. This is capital J. Capital J nu is the intensity average over all solid angles. So I nu d omega divided by 4 pi. So this is called the mean specific intensity. Sometimes the, the emission is isotropic. The intensity has no angle dependence. Then J nu is same as the intensity. Sometimes intensity is an isotropic. Then JNU is although it gives you a measure of the specific intensity, it does not give you what is the angle dependence. Okay, now we all know about the inverse square law of radiation. That things fall off as one by R. Let's see if that is satisfied by what we have defined so far. Let us consider a sphere where at the surface of the sphere, the intensity is radiant and uniform or the value is same at each point on the vertical sphere of the previous part. So I nu is I zero and it's all radio. Okay, so now what we want to find out is what is the total class at a point P, which is a distance smaller from the radius of the center of the sphere. So then the basic definition F, F nu is I I naught cos theta P okay. of The intensity is same. Everywhere. So then the integration will occur over the sphere because this is the body that is emitting the radiation. What will be the limit of the integration? So I'm integrating here, and the theta would the solid angle of the theta would start from the normal and increase in size based on the angle from the normal from the dotted line, dashed line. So there will naturally be a limit of the integration. So of course there is a two pi term here because of the pi symmetry of the problem. That's why you have two pi. And the limit is from zero to the C. It's a tangent from this point to this sphere. Because any point beyond the tangent will not contribute to this point. Right? This integral is very trivial. You'll find it is pi i naught sine square theta c. Good. Now let us see what is this sine square theta c. You draw a radius vector from here to the tangent point. This is R, the very basic definition of the sine theta c is capital R by R. You put everything together, you get, you recover the inverse square form of the plus. Interesting point is so the flux function looks like that. It's phi i naught capital R by R plus square. Interesting point is if you have a system where the intensity is constant over a given surface. You go at the point of the surface itself. Then flux at the surface is pi times I zero. Okay. This is very important because we will again use this when we study black body. Good. So far, so good. Now we will study something called density. 
or emission pollution. So things emit radiation and that's what we see. This is something that we use to quantify the emission in terms of energy use per unit volume. So we define something called the emission volume, which is energy per unit solid angle, per unit time, per unit volume, per unit frequency. So the total energy coming from that object is J mu times dB. This gives you the total energy. Then uh, into the multiplied by the solid angle, by, by time, by dB. So the definition of J nu, if you look at the units carefully, J nu is energy per unit solid angle per D by J nu by D. So if the emission is isotropic with power P nu, and if you just look at how the definition, so power P nu per unit volume per unit frequency. So in when you go for emission processes to understand the different mechanisms by which things emit radiation or moving charges emit radiation. Often it is easier to find what is the power being emitted by the moving charges. So emission happens due to motion of charges. And so if you find out the power by whatever uh, formula you use for the retarded potentials, etc., then you can immediately find what is the emission position. And if the power is isotropic, you find P mu divided by 4 pi. So you have to find the power per unit volume, per unit frequency, and then uh, per unit solid angle, which is 1 by 4 pi. Okay, so now if a ray of light is passing through a volume, and the volume is contributing towards a ray of light by emitting or adding energy to the ray of light, what is the change in the intensity of the light? Let's see. So, starting from the basic definition of intensity again. So, if I go back to the definition of intensity, I knew this. Uh, so, delta E is I knew D A D D omega D. So, similarly, delta E is D I D omega D. Why I'm writing it here because there is a change in the intensity because of the emission. But this delta dE or delta energy is also related to what we have just defined in terms of the emission coefficient. This gain in d omega d dA. So volume I'm writing as d a times d s for the path length. So now the concept of path length is being introduced because intensity is traveling along a rate we apply. So you have an area and a uh, distance over which it is traveling. So area and distance. So if you cancel out all the terms, you will find that the wave intensity is related to the emission coefficient is DIU equals to DU. Yes. This is the first definition, the first term in the regular class variable. So this takes care of emission. What about absorption? So suppose that the ray of light is passing through a volume, and that volume has elements that can absorb the light. So the uh, we come to the more specific definition, but essentially the a fraction of the energy is getting absorbed by the absorbing elements present inside the volume. So then to quantify this, we define an absorption coefficient alpha mu, which is Vi nu goes to minus alpha nu R nu ds. This is the basic definition of alpha nu. You soon see how it is related to the fundamental microscopic points. So starting from this definition, let's try to see what is it related to in terms of the absorption cross section. So if it's filled with particles, each particle is, has some area over which it can absorb the radiation. So some absorption cross section is related to each particle. So each particle you can think of, there's a finite area over which if it's any photon comes and strikes the particle within that area, that photon gets absorbed. So that is called absorption cross section. Or if you have, do not, if you want, don't want to think into the district photons, if you have an energy per unit area, then the energy, uh, the energy falling within this area is absorbed. So if you want to find energy 
Further in the area, multiply by the total area. That is the total energy incident on this unit volume here. Any ray that is passing through this small uh, cross section area over each particle that is getting absorbed. So that we call as the absorption cross section, a sigma A. Okay, so suppose there are n absorbers in a unit volume of uh, so this is n is the number of density of absorbers. Okay? So n the total absorbers is n times d a times the ds. And so the, my ray of light is possible. Again, from the basic definition, so I, I say that the intensity is reduced because of absorption. So from the basic definition of intensity, there's a reduction. So that is minus i d n minus d n uh, times area, solid angle, time, frequency. Okay. Now let us see. I have said that what is the total incident energy that is falling on all of these objects? The total energy is I mu d a d and d omega d t. Okay. Now what is the total uh, cross section presented by these objects uh, uh, that is absorbing this radiation? So that is n times sigma nu times ds. So this amount of energy is very getting absorbed because part of the basic definition of absorption coefficient uh, of the total area that's available of the intensity of the rays falling towards you, a fraction would be absorbed, which corresponds to the sigma, sigma for each particle. We multiply that with the total number of particles. So if you cancel out all the terms, you will find that the reduction of intensity di you know, is minus n sigma nu i d s. Compare this with my basic definition of absorption coefficient. You'll find absorption coefficient is related to the number density of particles and the absorption cross section. Now the absorption cross section is a fundamental property of the particle itself. So that comes in the microphysical process of the, of the way the absorption takes place. This multiplied by the number density of the absorbing particles gives you the absorption. You must remember that the coefficient of mm -hmm. units of alpha nu and j nu are different. Why? Because j nu is related to di nu as di nu goes to j nu times ds. So j nu has energy. For alpha nu, we have intensity on both sides, so the energy cancels out. If you work out all the energy, you'll find alpha nu is in units of centimeter inverse. So if we write down the change in intensity for a given ray that's passing through a medium due to both emission and absorption, you'll find that you can write this equation. So this is the fundamental equation of radiative transfer. Diu ds equals to j nu minus alpha nu. So this is a very powerful equation because now, for example, you know the intensity that a star is giving, giving out. Now that ray is coming towards us. And while it is traveling, it's passing through the media, which can add both emission onto the ray or subtract emission or subtract energy out of the ray. So given a intensity distribution at a source point, we can find the intensity distribution at the observing point by solving this particular case. <coughs> it looks deceptively simple, but it is not so simple. I'll show you the results. So, so this is the time independent equation that I discussed earlier. If you work out the full time dependent transfer equation, again, I'm not sure the derivation, but this derivation is trivial, but you can learn more about it from the Nihalas and Nihalas book. We have another del i u del t on my theta. And as you can see, this becomes a partial detection. Uh, so the intensity has to also change with time. So there is a finite time effect that is related to one by c del i u del t. This time equivalent, we can drop this term. Now let us focus on this term. So this is the rate of change of intensity along a given path, given rate. The ray can have any arbitrary orientation with respect to your coordinate system. So suppose now we work in Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. So then we can divide, we can rewrite this in terms of a chain rule of particle and derivatives. So di nu ds is if I have x, y, z, then del x del s, di nu del x, 
the y the less, the i mean the y, so on. Okay. Everyone agrees with this? Look at these steps here. So if you have a general line, It's angle here, angle here, here, x1. Okay. If you have a general line going in some direction, making some angle with each of the x, y, z axis, do you know what these are called? These derivatives are called? You've done some three D trigonometry. This is also not the school. Have you heard of direction cosines? These are related to direction cosines of that. So essentially, it defines the angle of that line. So nothing to do with astrophysics, just basic. So we can rewrite this equation as nx times di mu dx. Plus ny times the annual to y plus nz times the annual to z. This is nothing but n dot that. You all understand what this value is? So, to solve the radial transfer equation in a most generalized setting, this is a full transfer equation for a time dependent equation. Again, as I was saying, when you Work with coupling fluids to radiation. You solve the basic fluid equations. Along with it, you also have to solve this. I'll not show you the full equations of the fluid radiation hypothesis, but this forms the basic equation for solving this. Now, so I've just introduced this so that you know what is the most general form of the transfer equation. I will drop the time dependent one and come back to the simpler form. This is steady state solution from time dependent. Now, as a first simple case, let us consider only a block. Okay, so there's no issue. So we have light starting from S0 goes towards S, and as it is passing from medium, there's some absorption happening. So what is the solution of this? I think you all you all know this in some form. This exponential dq of intensity. And this is the mathematical derivation of y with r. Proper formalizing the derivation of why this exponential decay. So, this is a trivial solution. I knew is I knew at S0 to work out the, uh, uh, the integration constants. What you have to find out is the integral over the absorption coefficient. Now, absorption coefficient may be constant throughout its trajectory or may be dependent on the local properties of the system. Uh, in, for example, in uh, one such problem in French color, as I will uh, discuss, you'll find that that is related to the square of the density. And if it's related to the square of the density, if the density is varying along the path of the ray, then of course, this is not a constant. So if you integrate over the entire length, this integral is called the optical depth. Again, I think this is some concept that we've already been introduced for this optical depth. Optical depth is you integrate the absorption coefficient. Along a given direction, along the path length, along the other direction. So alpha times T S gives the total optical depth. You can also write in terms of a differential form, theta mu is alpha times T S. So this is just integral over theta theta. So if you write this in terms of optical depth, this is I mu at S is I mu at S0, the starting point, and exponential minus star. So this is a very powerful equation. What does it tell you? It tells you that if tau is greater than one, then the emission from coming through this object here will drastically decrease, will exponentially decrease. As, uh, as we go deeper and deeper into the object. So for example, think of radiation coming from outside into our planet, into the atmosphere. I was talking about this transmission coefficient in zero. Why are they zero? Because the optical depth 
2004. Similarly, radiation coming from outside going inside the star. So most of this radiation transfer was initially developed for studying radiation from stellar envelopes. So the outer layers of the stars, both radiation coming in and radiation going out. But the fundamental point is if tau is greater than one, then the intensity increases. However, if tau is less than one, then the intensity at this point is almost the same as intensity at this point. So this is optically thin. Optically thin is when tau is greater than one. So to characterize uh, the property of the system in terms of its transmission coefficient, we always start out with taking this integral here. We first check whether it's optically thick. If it's optically thick, just multiply it. Even the order of magnitude estimates are fine. You don't have to do the full integral in terms of the way. Astrophysics is more hand wavy. You start off by doing hand wavy stuff and then you follow uh, accurate physics. You just take the mean alpha, multiply the total path length, and just check what is the order of magnitude estimate of the optical depth. Of the optical depth. If tau is close to one, of course, then it doesn't have to be exactly one. Even if it's 0.9, you can understand that it's still going to attain those things. If tau is, uh, let's say, 0.1 or 0.01, then of course, this will not affect uh, Also, do note that this is a function of frequency. Certain frequencies will get absorbed, certain frequencies will not get absorbed. And that is the beauty of it. And that is why, in the first slide, as I showed, certain, there were optical depth was high for certain frequencies. And less for certain, especially with the infrared band, there are a lot of spikes. For certain transitions, optical depth certainly shoots up. And that is fine, okay? I don't know the problem. Okay, so this is the concept of optical depth. There is another interesting way of looking at optical depth and also related to the mean field part. And we all, all learned about mean field part from kinetic theory of gases. This is another way of looking at it. So, in terms of intensity, I have defined so far is energy per unit area, et cetera, et cetera. You can also think of it as a bunch of photons falling onto that unit area and then traveling in a given direction. And if a part of the intensity, a part of the energy is absorbed, then that means some of the photons are getting absorbed. So this very expression of optical there can think of it as a probability distribution. What is the probability that given n photons of a given energy falling on a surface, what fraction of them get absorbed? That fraction is e to the minus tau. So the probability distribution of photons we get absorbed is e to the minus tau. What is the mean optical depth to the region then? Multiply the probability to be integrated over the full optical depth range. Mean tau is one. Now you relate this mean tau to the mean length over which the absorption will take place. You know that what is alpha nu. Again, as I said, don't fret about what is the uh, uh, spatial dependence of alpha nu. I'm talking about a small region of space over which alpha nu is constant. That's it. So tau nu is alpha nu times L nu bar. And new bar is the mean peak part. So, by definition of mean peak part, in terms of the optical depth, is by traveling what distance along the range would the photon get absorbed? So, as I said, op when optical depth becomes one, then the absorption becomes significant. So, tau mean tau one equals to alpha and L bar. So, mean peak part is one by L. It is one by N sigma. You come at, come at it from the point of view of kinetic theory of gases. What is the mean cross section? What is the mean uh, path between two absorbing absorbers? You also arrive at the same point. This is the area, which is the number density for unit volume. So the length is one by n six. Okay, last five minutes. Okay, so now we have done. What is the uh, solution of the transfer equation with two absorption? Now let us also put in emission. To put in emission, we we'll slightly modify the equations. So this is my starting equation. I will divide everywhere by alpha nu. 
So this becomes d i nu by alpha nu s minus i nu plus j nu by alpha nu. I'll redefine some terms. So now you can see clearly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to read out the equation in terms of topic. So alpha minus ds is theta. So di nu theta equals to minus i nu plus whatever this ratio was. This ratio of the emission coefficient and absorption coefficient is called the source function. Again, this is very fundamental. And as you can understand, this j nu and alpha nu are related to the microscopic properties of the system. So what kind of system is emitting the giving rise to the emission of the absorption? Also, very, very interestingly, if you somehow know what is the source function, somehow from some external uh, input, and you know what is the genu, you can find alpha. We will use this to find the absorption coefficient for objects in thermal equilibrium with radiation field. So objects in thermal equilibrium with the radiation field, by definition, that's a black body radiation field. I'll show you that the black body radiation fields S new source function can be evaluated from basic statistical physics. Now, as I said, if I know the source function from basic statistical thermal physics, I know what is the emission coefficient. I know what is the algorithm. So this is a very powerful formula. It's, uh, and it's called the law. It shows you that the alpha nu and j nu are two parts of the same point. So same system can emit as well as absorb if it can come in equilibrium with the say if you know the source function of the system. But for our uh, example, I was pointing out if it comes in equilibrium with the radiation field, the black body radiation field, if it's a thermal system with a well-defined temperature, and that temperature matches with the black body radiation field, so then we and if we can find this J here, we can find that. So when we discuss Bremsch Stroll of emission due to thermal bodies, thermal objects, we will calculate what is J from the microphysical description of how electrons are scattered due to uh, ions or photons. I will not calculate the microphysics of alchemy. I will just use the fact that that's a thermal system. I have already found out what is genu. I can find out. Okay, good. So now we have this equation. We have to solve it. To solve it, we multiply F square by H for town and integrating factor. You multiply everywhere, you can write the left hand side term as the total derivative with respect to the, uh, uh, the optical depth. And this, this is trivial. I'll, I'll show you how this comes. Again, it's already trivial anyway. You integrate over uh, two points. So suppose. This is your path length S, starting from S1 and S2. For the optical depth at S1 is tau 1, optical depth at S2 is tau 2. You integrate this equation, you put in the values of integrals, you find that this is the solution. Now, note uh, how does this, this come about? You just you solve this part, you get e to the power tau 2 times i nu at tau 2 minus e to the power tau 1 at i nu at tau 1. I multiply everywhere by or divide everywhere by tau. So this is very trivial. And this integral, I just take tau 2 inside this integral because tau 2 is constant. Is anybody who did not understand this? Don't have to feel shy. Don't understand something? Very good. No okay, so this integral, this form of a solution looks very simple. Right? It is actually not because of this source function that is here. Now, in any generalized system, we do not know actually what is the source function. If you can find out what is the genuine algorithm for that particular system, well and good. If you cannot, then the source function is undefined or undetermined. But we can always make some approximations to the source function. 
And I will show you what the source of candles are. But if it's a black body distribution or close to a black body distribution, you can always expand the source of in a Taylor series about the black body source of. And as you see, the source of is a function of the top. So the first term, the zero term, black body. The second order term could be tau and tau square, etc. So that is how this integral becomes very complicated. So let's take a very really basic assumption that the source function is constant all throughout. It is not dependent on the local properties or the properties there. Then I can take this out of the integral here. If I take this out of the integral here, so firstly, before doing all that, let us look at the definition of source function. Source function is J nu by alpha nu. If I do not have any emission, then source function is zero. Then this integral is zero. My solution is I nu, it is about minus whatever the difference is of the gap. Exactly the same as what I had for pure absorption. So this works out for pure absorption. The equations are correct. Now for constant S nu, S nu I take the S nu out, just put in the value. So tau 2 will come out of the integral. You have to, you have to import tau nu prime theta. You just integrate, right? There is no time for this, but you can actually work, work this out. Uh, this is S nu plus exponential tau 2 minus tau 1, and whatever is in this Now, suppose. By the between these two points, my optical depth increases pretty much. So tau 2 minus tau 1 tends to infinity. <coughs> In that case, this con contribution from anything from this is almost negligible. So the intensity is equals to the source function. Now remember, I had assumed constant source function. For a black body distribution, so this is the case that source function is constant. So I will show you why your black body is, what is the distribution of black body, but just for a general reference, for a black body distribution, this is true. The system is optically thick, but tau becomes very large. And the intensity tends towards the source function. I knew that's the S the black body system. So what have we learned today? We learned about the basic definition of intensity. We learned about, and I would strongly advise that even though this is a summer school, you would not get any you know, grades are not dependent on it, but you will not come back to this concept without you know, going through a set of lectures. But knowing about the basic definitions, even if you don't recall what is the solution of this equation, fine. Basic definition of intensity and the units of intensity, basic definition of flux, units of flux. How is flux related to intensity? How is intensity related to the energy density? U omega is I nu by C. And what is the definition of absorption coefficient and optical value? These fundamentals are essential for you to take away, no matter what level you are in. Okay, so I'll stop here. We'll meet tomorrow at 9 30. I'll stop.